Hi, everyone. Welcome to Mama Wears Athleisure. I am your host, Mariella de Santiago, a first time mom. We focus on all things mom with tips to help make life easier and more organized for all you mamas out there. Hi, everyone. Today, I'm here with Jennifer from Femme Strong. We're going to talk a little bit about intimacy. So if you are in a place where maybe you aren't comfortable having anyone listen to this, this would be a good time to go to a different room or maybe put some headphones on. We'll be talking about bodily fluids and again, getting intimate. Hello. Happy to be here. So I'm Dr. Jenny. I'm a pelvic floor physical therapist, and my practice is based out of San Diego, and I do mobile services. So I come to you, and I treat throughout San Diego and in Temecula. And what I really focus on is working with women that have some kind of pelvic floor dysfunction going on, maybe some orthopedic things going on, and we just address it on the side of pelvic floor and orthopedic physical therapy. My practice is very, very holistic, I'll put it that way. So we don't just address, you know, the the one thing that's happening, because usually it has to do a lot with other body parts, and encompasses more than just that one area that you may be having a problem with. So just to kind of start off, would you be able to share a little bit about what the pelvic floor is and why it's important during the perinatal period? Yes. So the pelvic floor, essentially, it's a group of muscles at the bottom of the pelvis, and they have different responsibilities that help us with different bodily functions, right? So they help support the visceral Ah. organs. So our stomach, you know, our intestines, our bladder, our uterus, they help support all of that. They help with sensation and sexual function, and they support urination and bowel movements. On top of that, they also assist with proper breathing mechanics, and they help stabilize the pelvis and the spine, which essentially means it supports your entire body, in essence. So a very important part of our body. (laughs) Exactly. One that is not given the uh, recognition that it deserves. (laughs) Well, I didn't hear anything about it until after I had my baby about how important it really is during your pregnancy and after. So yes, definitely not given enough recognition. So I want to go ahead and just jump straight into what our topic is, which is getting intimate or intercourse, which the term that you use is dyspareunia. Is that correct? Yeah. What is this? (laughs) So dyspareunia is a big umbrella term that basically means pain with intercourse but it gets more specific than that. So there's vaginismus, which is pain with penetration or insertion into the vaginal canal. And this can be from intercourse. It can be from having a gynecological or OB exam. It could be from trying to insert tampons or a menstrual cup, anything that involves some sort of insertion into the canal. That is then different from someone who may only have some discomfort or sensitivity on the outside of their vulva. And that could be just with any type of touch, you know, maybe it's the fabric on your underwear, it is your partner's touch, anything like that. That one is called vulvodynia. So different terms, but generally the umbrella term for all of it is dyspareunia. So I wanted to talk about this because you don't get any sort of info on it when, you know, after you've had your baby, you just kind of get the whole spiel about what you can't do for six to eight weeks. Mm -hmm. But the reality is that six to eight weeks really isn't enough for the pain to go away. Right. And I think that women tend to have this and then it's like, oh, it's okay. Like you just kind of get used to it or it's no longer enjoyable. So why does this occur? It is a big one. It's, it's, <laughs> it's one that gets me really frustrated with, you know, the way that our society is just where it, again, it doesn't give it the recognition it deserves, but like, because it's a negative thing, right? Dyspareunia, it happens with 
many women, it can happen with men too, but more commonly, and because I work with women, we're going to talk about obviously the women's side, right? There's two reasons why it occurs. One is a primary reason. And that means that it's something that started organically. And it usually has to do with some kind of illness, disease or mindset. And this can be from having a diagnosis of endometriosis or polycystic ovarian syndrome, or growing up in that purity culture, you know, where you have to wait until a certain point to have intercourse or intercourse is viewed in a certain manner that may be different than what our usual way of thinking about it is now, right? And the last one is through menopause, because that is technically an organic thing that happens to women. The second one is secondary reason, obviously, and it happens after some type of event or experience. So birthing a baby and having something go differently in, within that, having some other form of traumatic experience, or just having some type of surgery. All of those are considered secondary reasons for dyspareunia being created. How can an individual relieve this pain that occurs? You have to address it from different angles. Ultimately, it encompasses different aspects of being a human. It's not just, this is your pelvic floor. This is what's wrong with it. Let's fix it. For starters, you want to address the physical and you do that by working with the pelvic floor physical therapist like me. We focus on figuring out what the physiological cause is for the pain. And most of the time it ends up being a hyperactivity or increased tension of the pelvic floor muscles. If it's pain with insertion or deeper pelvic floor muscles, what I want to say about that is that that hyperactivity can either be from the superficial pelvic floor muscles, if it's pain with in initial insertion, right? Or if it's pain with deeper insertion, it has to do with more of those deeper pelvic floor muscles because there is layers to it. And the way that we address it, address this pain is through manual work to release that tension, breath work and different mobility exercises that are all specific in teaching the nervous system to let go. That's important because then that allows the muscles to relax and be in a more neutral state. Sometimes the physical is not enough. We also need to address the mental and the emotional aspect of it, right? There's so much that people with dyspareunia hold back and others may not see what's going on in their mind but it can really affect your mental health, especially if you want to have intercourse, if you have a partner that you want to be intimate with, if you want to use menstrual cups or tampons just to help, you know, you during your menstruation, maybe like not dreading going to a gyno exam or really just feeling a sense of normalcy. There's so many variables or like so many things that may be going on in your mind about this that really affect you, but you may not be sharing with anyone, right? So all of that anxiety and stress that that dyspareunia can cause not only affects your interactions socially, your physiology as well. Many times the women that I work with only get so far with their physical progress because there's that mental block and it's going to keep limiting them until they address it. And for that reason, I include meditation and self-reflection in my sessions, but I'm not a mental health therapist, right? Or I'm a physical therapist. So I always give my recommendations for mental health therapists and emphasize how important it is that both types of therapies are done to address the dyspareunia. I would have never thought of that, but it totally makes sense. Yeah. And I know that answer to this one's going to probably vary by person, but how long does it take for the pain to ease or for somebody to kind of start seeing some improvement? It's a tough question even tougher to answer. Uh, and you're not going to like the answer. <laughs> but it really depends on the individual. It matters how long you've had the condition for how consistent you are with therapy, and the work that you have to put into it outside of the sessions. It matters where your mindset is the support that you're having from your partner and your family. All of this, all of this affects your progress. And I don't like giving a numerical time frame because if someone doesn't get better during that time frame, they're going to feel bad, right? They're going to feel like they're worse off than they thought. And that's simply not the case. Everyone marches to the beat of their own drum. And although that may not be the case for medical healing, it's the case for more holistic body healing, which aligns more with the treatment of dyspareunia. 
you know, it's not just like, oh, you have a cut. Usually the tissue around a cut takes a week to, you know, come back together and then maybe another month for scar tissue to form. It's, it's not like that. It's simply not that simple. That makes sense. And again, it is going to vary from person to person and what sort of, I guess, practice or what it is that they're doing outside of the sessions to also help with the progress there. I guess that would kind of go with anything, right? Like if you break a bone and you're going to physical therapy for that, like you also, you still have to do exercises outside of your sessions and the more you do them, or if you don't do them, that's going to affect how long it takes for something to heal. Yeah. It's not a quick fix. We're humans and we take some time, you know, we, we need that TLC to get better. So uh, you kind of already talked about this a little bit, but what does the pelvic floor have to do with this and how can it alleviate or help with the pain? So going to see you, what would you kind of do to help somebody that's struggling with this? You're going to have to pause me if I got on my soapbox on this one. (laughs) It's hard not to. (laughs) You'll have to intervene. But okay, so I'll start off by saying Usually, the pelvic floor strength is not the issue. It's the pelvic floor tension. So if you only focus on strengthening, I know many of you think that the way to strengthen the pelvic floor is to do the infamous Kegel. (laughs) So if you do this, you're only making the tension worse. It's not what's indicated to overcome dyspareunia. Instead, it's that relaxation and taking the nervous system out of that sympathetic response, you know, that fight or flight, and allowing it to ease into the parasympathetic state, that rest. If something is strong and tight, nothing is going through it. Simple as that, right? If it's relaxed and flexible, then that welcomes movement and insertion. So ultimately, a healthy pelvic floor does have some level of strength, but it also relaxes. Both are important because both are required for different bodily functions. Strength is needed to stabilize the body and relaxation is needed to support different physiological functions specific to the pelvic floor. And I think I just actually answered not your question, right? (laughs) (laughs) You did just jump ahead. Like what would a session with you look like? So if I was going through this and came to see you, what can I expect? A session with me, The what we do first is we talk about what's going on, right? Get a good essence of what you're dealing with, what you're feeling, how it's impacting you. And, and then we do an assessment. And every part of the assessment is based on consent. So important for this type of work, right? And we look at posture. We look at your movement, just the different physiological movements that you need to do day to day. Squat, lift jump, you know, all of that. And then the other part of it, if you're comfortable with it is an intravaginal exam. It's not completely necessary. It's not mandatory at all whatsoever. We can do without it, but it does give me a better understanding of what the pelvic floor is doing. And I can get really specific with it because even though it's called the pelvic floor, each one down there is a different muscle. And it does a specific thing because it connects to different parts of your pelvis. So we take a look at all of that and see where it is that you might be holding the tension or where it is that the muscles aren't coordinating and relaxing and contracting when they should be. And then we come up with a plan for you. We decide what would be best, whether it is that we do manual work to release the tension, you know, whether it is that we only focus on mobility, wherever you're willing to go with this is where will go. I do take your goals into account more so than what I think would be best for you because ultimately it's your life, it's your body, it's how you're going to deal with it when you're faced with different situations. And that's more important than whatever that I think I have to say about it. Finally, any other thoughts, suggestions, or recommendations when it comes to pain with intercourse or somebody that maybe is considering going to see someone or that isn't really sure where to start? I always have so much more to say. I'll leave it at this. Okay. So first off, please don't do a million kegels and try to address the dyspareunia through this. I love that you say that because I feel like every every podcast interview that I have with the pelvic floor therapist, that's their 
common is don't do those. So we have this like misinformation of what, when you're supposed to do them and what they're supposed to do. And yeah. Think- well, so hopefully enough of us say it. So where the consensus is, no, don't do the kegels, you know, you'll start hearing that more. So then I feel like kegels. I need to do an episode on that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That that's my first one. The other part is well, kind of goes with it, right? Don't listen to anyone that tells you pain is a part of it. Pain is a part of postpartum, you know, whether it is with intercourse or just wearing some different types of underwear, you know, it is not a part of it. It doesn't matter if it was a medical provider that told you this, or if it was your grandma, dyspareunia can be addressed. And even though it's common, it doesn't have to be permanent. It just does not. And this is my, my last point. And I say this because I feel it's really important. If this is something that's greatly affecting your well-being, you are allowed to take up time and space to address it. You deserve it. And you are worthy of having pleasure with intercourse. Simple as that. Thank you for all of that. I appreciate all the very valid points. And again, just the focus on don't do the kegels and that you shouldn't just get used to something because like, I feel like now that I am a mom, that's a very common thing. Like, oh yeah, you just kind of get used to it, especially with, with other, when you hear people talk about the pelvic floor, like, yeah, you just get used to that. Yeah. You just get used to that. And it shouldn't be that way. Like, I don't want to have to get used to changes in my body. I'm already having to go through changes in my personal life with learning how to be a parent and realizing that I don't get to sleep in past 6 a.m. And, and yeah. We're already compromising on so much and not to to complain because I I love my son. Yeah, we shouldn't have to compromise in every single aspect if there is the possibility of getting attention to something that can be fixed. 100%. And I'll go further and say that, you know, sometimes it is okay to complain. Like it doesn't mean that you're not going to do it or you're resentful for whatever reason, like it's hard. It's so hard. And it's okay to complain and let it out once in a while. Yes, <laughs> it is. <laughs> you kind of need to be able to, right? That's what venting is all about. I mean, you need that time to just be able to let it all out and it feels good to vent. And then it's, you're good and you can move on. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, thank you so much for taking time to chat with us about this. It's nice to be able to get a input from a specialist. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, I am always happy to talk about this topic. If I had a, a favorite type of woman to work with, which I don't, but if I did, (laughs) Um, I would say it's the ones that are dealing with that type of issue, you know, dyspareunia, vaginismus, vulvodynia. I just think there's so much growth and progress that you can achieve from addressing it. And it just affects your well-being in so many ways. So I'm, I'm happy to be that support system through that. Thank you for listening. Tune in next week for our next episode. You can find us on Instagram for more updates and tips. Be sure to subscribe wherever you listen to your podcasts and give us a review if you like us.